Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality characteristics that may be at work in the Luca Magnotta case. Magnotta is a convicted murderer who's imprisoned in Canada. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background and the timeline of the crime. Those will be combined in this video. And then I'll look at the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background and timeline, Luca Magnata was born on July 24, 1982 in Canada, specifically Scarborough, Ontario. His name was Eric Newman at that point. He would change his name later on when he was 24. His parents were married just before he was born. His mother was 16 and his father was 17. His parents did not have a lot of money. Luca described his mother as having an obsession with cleanliness. She would make him and his siblings wash their hands until their skin was irritated. And she did not take well to his bedwetting behavior. So bedwetting, of course, one of those signs that's tied to psychopathy. He described his mother as a horrible person and described his father as an alcoholic and said his father suffered from schizophrenia. Luca had challenges in school. He was initially placed in special education classes because he had difficulty with reading and math. The other kids made fun of him because he was shy, because he was gay, and because he wore inexpensive clothing. He dropped out of grade 11 when he was 17 due to mental health symptoms. He said he had poor concentration and he was hearing things. He had a number of lower level jobs. With many of them, he only lasted a matter of weeks or months before he was fired. He had poor attendance and poor work performance. In 2001, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Sometime in his early 20s, he started working as a prostitute. It's been reported that he had five to six clients per day. He had repeated traumatizing experiences in this line of work. In 2004, Luca became friends with a 21-year-old female who had an intellectual disability. He manipulated her into applying for credit cards and then he charged over $10,000 on those cards. He was convicted of three counts of fraud and one count of criminal impersonation in 2005. He served 16 days in jail, followed by nine months of community service. After that, he was put on probation for 12 months. The police had evidence that he was involved in an assault of a sexual nature against that victim, but they decided to drop the charges, missing an important opportunity to stop Luca's criminal behavior. Before Luca was sentenced in this case, the court was aware of a report indicating he had significant psychiatric issues. In response, the court simply told him he had a medical problem and always needed to take his medication. That same year, we see he expresses an interest in becoming a police officer who investigates homicides. This is interesting because a desire in police work is fairly common among people who would become serial killers. At this point, he also became involved in making adult movies. Lucas set up a number of fake social media accounts and websites he started a rumor that he was dating a notorious murderer named Carla Hamaka, only to go out of his way to deny this non-existent relationship, suggesting the rumor that he started was destroying his reputation. In 2007, we see he files for bankruptcy. He said he was sick and had no job. In that same year, he auditions for a reality show called Cover Guy. In an interview, he tells the judges that some people say he's devastatingly good-looking. They reject him, but in February 2008, he comes before judges for a reality show and tells them how he had hair transplants, his nose done, and how he wanted to get muscle implants in his arms. Given his behavior, I'm surprised no one recommended logic implants in his head. That would have made a lot more sense under the circumstances. In 2008, Luca continued to try to attract as much attention as he could online. He created these rumors about himself and then, using other profiles, he made posts to deny those rumors, so similar to what he did before. It's thought he may have had dozens of different identities online. He desperately tried to get his own Wikipedia page at this point, but he kept getting blocked. In 2009, Luca becomes a travel companion for a 70-year-old Toronto man. They travel to Italy, Russia, and France. In 2010, Luca resorts to posting violent messages and videos in a desperate attempt to attract attention. In December, he posts one where he ends the lives of two kittens. The videos are quickly taken down, but not before a number of people start trying to identify Luca. 
eventually organizing into a Facebook group with over 4,000 members. In 2011, a more focused group of people formed to investigate Luca. Eventually, they're able to figure out that he was likely in Toronto. The Toronto police start an official investigation. At the end of this year, Luca posts more videos of the same nature. That same year, he also threatened a newspaper in London who published a story about the killer. In 2012, the online sleuths figure out that Luca may be in Montreal. They did this by comparing the Google Street View to one of the pictures Luca had posted. May 24, 2012, Luca murders Concordia University student June Lin. The next day, he posted a video featuring that murder. He dismembered the body and mailed the parts to various locations around Montreal. On May 30, the police named Luca Magnata a suspect in this murder. On June 3, 2012, Luca is spotted in Paris. He is arrested the next day in Berlin. He was at an internet cafe looking at stories about himself. He was extradited to Canada and pled not guilty to several charges, including first-degree murder. Luca requested a jury trial. During the trial, we see that his attorney argued that Luca was in a psychotic state and should not be held responsible for his actions. He was found guilty on all charges and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. I imagine he spends his time designing a course called How to Draw the Unwavering Disdain of Every Human Being on Earth. He certainly didn't impress a lot of people, and we see this special on Netflix about him that really hurt his reputation even more, although I think his reputation was already pretty much at zero. So I guess it kind of pushed it below zero. It's like negative reputation. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. Luca's behavior aligns with a number of characteristics of cluster B personality traits. Before I get into the behavioral alignments, let's see how the mental health professionals at his trial testified. There were six professionals who testified, one independent, three for the defense, and two for the prosecution. In Canada, the prosecution is referred to as the Crown. Now, the independent expert said that Luca had borderline personality disorder with histrionic traits. Two defense experts said Luca had paranoid schizophrenia. The last one said he had schizophrenia, borderline, and histrionic. The Crown experts differed in their determination. One said antisocial, histrionic, and narcissistic, and the other said borderline. So between the two of them, they covered all of the cluster B personality disorders. Now taking a look at these cluster B personality features, I don't know specifically what was happening with Luca, of course. But what could be going on with this type of behavior in a situation like this? Now, looking at the schizophrenia angle, I was surprised that some of the mental health professionals did not believe Luca had schizophrenia. His history was fairly well documented. We see disorganized speech, hallucinations, delusions, and flat affect. Now, it could be that these experts were working for the Crown, and a lot of times prosecution experts come up with disorders not related to psychosis. But here we see the independent expert also did not report schizophrenia. So going back to personality, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, all the personality disorders fall into three clusters, A, B, and C. As I've talked about before, cluster B personality pathology has four personality disorders, antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. It's not unusual to see situations where a person has more than one of these disorders, but it's rare that someone's behavior could align with all four. Considering what the mental health experts said in this case, let's take a closer look at these four disorders. Looking at antisocial personality, we see criminal behavior, lying, impulsivity, aggression, a reckless disregard for safety, being irresponsible, and having no remorse. Now, one could make an argument for all of these, but it's worth noting that only one expert thought that Luca had antisocial personality. I think the real question here was, did these symptoms represent a pervasive pattern? So he may have lied and been reckless and had other symptoms, but was this really a tendency for him or just behaviors he engaged in occasionally? So were they really part of his personality? As far as narcissistic personality, we see grandiosity, fantasies of success and beauty, believing oneself to be special, requiring admiration, entitlement, manipulation, lacking empathy, having envy, and being arrogant. I think one could make a good argument for an alignment with all these behaviors, but again, we see most of the professionals did not think he had narcissistic personality. And one could also question his skills at manipulation. 
he didn't really seem to have a lot of social skills. He was more introverted as opposed to grandiose. So perhaps he wasn't really manipulative. He just happened to be able to convince some people to do what he wanted. It may not have been, again, like a personality trait, something that was pervasive over time. Now moving to borderline personality. I think much of this is really based on Luca's answers to questions during the assessment. He said that he had frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, an unstable self-image, that he was impulsive, and he had chronic feelings of emptiness, but he did not endorse any of the other symptoms. Now moving to histrionic personality, here we see eight features. I will go through these in detail because we see so many examples in his behavior. First symptom is uncomfortable when not the center of attention. This is described by some as actually being physically painful for the person who has it. So it's much more than a desire. It's something really rooted in their personality. With Luca's behavior, this seems to be one of the primary motivations. He just wanted to be in the spotlight all the time and for any reason. When he was not successful at getting attention for something positive, he moved to something negative, like ending the lives of animals and eventually killing a person. The second symptom, interactions with other people are characterized by inappropriate, sexually seductive, or provocative behavior. Luca's behavior may fit with this feature. His traveling companion, that I mentioned before, indicated that when Luca would walk into a room, it was like he was a model on a runway. Symptom number three, rapidly shifting and shallow expression of emotions. There's not a lot of information about this, but it's not a stretch to think he was shallow. Number four, using physical appearance to draw attention to oneself. This really ties in with the other behaviors I talked about. Symptom number five, a style of speech that is excessively impressionistic. So this is when somebody talks like they are giving the impression of something, like they don't really understand it. They just talk about it in a superficial way without really demonstrating a detailed knowledge of whatever they're talking about. This is somewhat related to being shallow, and again, there is evidence of this. Symptom six is self-dramatizing and theatrical. We see an exaggerated expression of emotion. Based on his online presence, it makes sense that this behavior would be endorsed. Now, the last two symptoms are being suggestible and evaluating friendships as more intimate than they actually are. There's really not enough information about his behavior to connect to those symptoms. So in stepping back and looking at this, one can make a good argument for an alignment with antisocial, narcissistic, and histrionic, maybe even borderline. It's just hard to know because of the possibility of psychosis. It's hard to know what's explained by personality and what's explained by losing touch with reality. I think the astounding part of this case is really how Luca was capable of doing anything necessary to have people pay attention to him. It's really tragic how pervasive this problem was for him. He was just desperately looking for anything to validate his feeling of being special. And I think that's really what this is about. His narcissism was not solidly in place, which explains why the professionals really couldn't agree about him being narcissistic. So we don't really see grandiose features, but we see vulnerable features, which of course don't line up well with the official diagnosis in the DSM, narcissistic personality disorder. That disorder is more related to grandiose narcissism. When somebody's narcissism is solidly grandiose, they automatically believe other people are admiring them. So often when narcissists see other people looking at them, they assume those people are in admiration, right? It's kind of the default stance. The narcissism we see here is more vulnerable. It wasn't stable. Luca needed constant attention so he could keep lying to himself to keep believing he was actually special. The level of validation he required was unusually high, even for a narcissist. With behavior like this, we could think of the need for admiration, the sense of entitlement, and the fantasy as being central, and the other characteristics are allowing Luca to meet his goals. If he needed aggression to meet his goal, that was available. If he needed a lack of empathy, that was there. If he needed to have a disregard for safety, to be irresponsible, to be impulsive, to lie, all those behaviors were available to him. Personality traits and psychosis can potentiate other personality traits. They can increase the power or effect of each other. They're like fuel on a fire. So the question becomes, is this what histrionic personality would look like without limits, separate from reality and separate from society's norms? Narcissism and histrionic traits infuse the self-centered desire. And psychosis 
and antisocial features unlock the potential of that desire, allowing it to express with lethal consequences. The real question with cases like this really always comes down to psychosis versus extreme personality traits. That was really the focus of this trial. Which one is primary? Is he somebody with schizophrenia who has abnormal personality traits? Or is he somebody with pathological personality who also has some psychosis? Because that question can't really be answered, his true level of culpability can never be accurately calculated. So those are my thoughts on Luca Magnata. If you have any opinions or thoughts, please put them in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.